The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, folks, wherever you are. Uh, this is Jason McGee from Take a Metrics. Uh, we are going to get started here in a few minutes. We're going to give folks a few minutes to start pouring in. Um, as you all can see, Q4 is here. Uh, we're going to be talking with our guest, Econ Engine, uh, about actual strategies. Uh, just hang tight for a couple minutes. Um, what I, one thing I will say, and I'll repeat myself as well, but uh, we want this to be very interactive. So use that chat feature. Matter of fact, I'd love to know where a lot of you all are from. So if you guys uh, can, please start uh, messaging in the chat. Tell us where you are, uh, see what's happening, and make sure you can hear my audio okay as well. So yeah, please, as soon as you guys get a chance, go ahead and, uh, and um, yeah, tell me where you're from. And Liz, you're with me, right? I am. Awesome. Liz, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I uh, I see some, we, we call them the repeat offenders in, in the uh, the folks who are, who are um, you know, reaching out and actually attending here today. You said you recognize some of the names as well? I do. I do. Um, it's always good to see the familiar names, and I love that the seller community as a whole is interested in education and interested in improving strategy. So that's just a make it's a it's a happy day for me. <laughs> so Sean uh, reached out and said, "Hey Liz, hey." <laughs> so we have Cam from Indianapolis. Uh, I've actually never been in Indianapolis. I don't know what's going on there. I bet it's a good time. Um, we it's a great place. <laughs> Is that, is that Beck? Oh, sorry, everybody. We have Becky creeping in the back. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I heard Indianapolis so, and I had to speak up. I had to so, speak up. You go ahead, Liz. Becky Trowbridge is uh, con is our content manager at Ecom Engine, and she works closely with me on outreach, seller education, and all that kind of stuff. So she's she's helping out today with uh, questions and all that jazz. So I'm always happy to have her with me. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm pumped to have you guys. Uh, uh, Ramesh from London, um, Ethan from Birmingham, Alabama. Fun fact, per capita, Alabama has the most new sellers on Amazon in a given month than any other uh, state. Uh, did you guys know that at Ecom Engine? No, we did not. That's fascinating. I was just in Salt Lake City, Utah, Sandy, Salt Lake City, Sandy area, and I know that Utah's got a lot of Amazon sellers, but did not know that that the fresh the fresh blood was was from Alabama. That's really cool. It is. It is. Lesick from uh, up in Seattle saying hi. Good to have you on, my friend. Um, Denver, got a lot of Denver. Um, yeah, it's crazy with. Uh, yeah, you know, never think about it in Alabama, but Utah is blowing up. A lot of service providers, a lot of agencies, um, you know, the works there. So, um, cool. We'll give everybody about one more minute here, and then we'll kick off. Laura, uh, oh, excuse me, is it pronounced Laura? Uh, in Boston, that's where I am. I'm actually in Virginia, uh, based in Virginia. You and I are, what, an hour away? Yeah, about about an hour. You're... Yeah, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm in Charlottesville, but I am actually at our headquarters in Boston today. So we're, we're actually close to, to those who are in, in Boston here. She could have so. watched you do this in person. No, I know. Uh, it, it'd be a letdown if you came and saw me in person. <laughs> it never is. Uh, Come on. Uh, Jonathan, from, um, waving from Ocean Park, Washington, Washington State. Well... Folks, how about we, what do you think? We should, should we go ahead and kick this bad boy off now? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So just to reiterate, uh, today is September 24th. Got that right. Showed up on time. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, Q4 is here. Actionable strategies to maximize revenue and seller health while you still have a chance. Uh, we talk about still having a chance a lot. We'll talk about the dates, but look, I mean, things really ramp up towards the end of October and into November, like we, we have a solid run rate of time for us to, to, to right the ship or make sure all of our, um, you know, everything's uh, in order. Um, just uh, go ahead, let's go ahead and inter introduce ourselves. I am the, the gentleman on the left. You probably got that by the voice. Um, Jason McGee, I'm the Director of Business Development at Take-A-Metrics. Liz, I've known you for years 
just had the opportunity to meet you finally in person what at midwest ecom and becky you as well a couple of months ago right yeah right. right right back in july yeah that is that is awesome yeah i know we both were able to speak there and i think that's when we actually were like sat down like all right let's go ahead and get some good content out together so yes. it's uh Awesome. Well, Liz, you want to give a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. I'm industry liaison for Ecom Engine, which is sort of a business development, outreach, sort of seller education, talk to all the people in the industry kind of role um, that I love a whole, whole lot. I got started in this role in 2016, and I just pretty much spend all day uh, learning about everything that I need to know in order to help our Amazon sellers uh, be successful on the marketplace. So it's fun stuff. Well, that's how you and I got uh, I uh, got in, in, in contact, right? I used to run partnerships for World First. And yeah, uh, uh, my job was to go out there and connect with solution providers and, and grow all of our brands collectively and help sellers. And Liz, I think you have a very similar um, you know, outlook in terms of what you're trying to accomplish at Ecom Engine. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm at Take a Metrics now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's funny as big as the world of Amazon selling is the smaller it is at the exact same time. You know what I mean? It's so true. Yeah. Um, a couple of housekeeping things again, like we're going to make this a live session. As you can see, this isn't recorded. Um, this is live, um, at least for those listening, uh, on September 24th or 4th at 107. But if you guys have questions if, if, or feedback and while we're talking, go ahead and chat away, Becky will help field them we will as well but yeah let's go ahead and kick things off here but we are recording so, right so everybody's going to receive a recording of the webinar after it's over we'll get a recording of the webinar they will also get um uh the slides as well sweet uh yeah absolutely so here's a quick agenda of what we are going to cover uh you're going to talk about feedback automation tips for seller health why product reviews continue to matter and why there are they're such a pain and how to do it both wrong and right mm -hmm. uh, why or is it great time to work on your ipi i'm then going to talk about prime day data and what that can tell us about q4 what is an ideal campaign structure to win how do we maximize roi during q4 what is hourly bidding and why is it an absolute game changer takeaways you guys get it you see <laughs> what we did there uh -huh. <laughs> you tell me I didn't like dad jokes and then I, or I need to work on my dad jokes. That is one, right? That, I mean, it's, it's pretty close to a dad joke. IPI. I told you we were going to get this question. I know. So IPI is your inventory performance index. And I should have spelled that out, but I was very, very stressed out about putting too many words on this slide. So I'm going to cover basically seller metrics that you have to pay attention to so that you can implement the strategies that Jason's going to talk about. Um, Absolutely. That's sort of how this all fits together. You, you guys owe me swag to be delivered to my home now after me getting that right. <laughs> um, here we go. Um, all right. Let's start off with some noteworthy dates. So we all know, obviously, I broke, we broke it down with October, November, December. October 1st is the official start to Q4. Um, still to be determined, there is going to be a last day to apply for FBA access. What this means is Amazon actually has a cutoff if you have not shipped to FBA before to apply to be a part of FBA, Amazon actually will cut off access to be able to apply to, to be a part of it. Also to make certain um, holiday season, uh, areas, like if you want to get your inventory there by, by Cyber Monday or Black Friday, there are actual dates you have to get your inventory to there by. I'll show you what it was last year. That's still TBD. November, the 1st to the 21st is truly the kickoff to the holiday season. 22nd to 28th is a countdown to Black Friday. Um, the Thanksgiving is on the 28th, and then the 29th is Black Friday. Cyber Monday uh, on the 2nd, it actually is in December this year. I think last year is what, at the end of uh, um, October, right? Yes. And then, Becky, thank you for this because you helped explain what 12 days of deals is. And Becky, do you want to talk about this real quick? Sure. So the 12 days of deals is just um, Amazon sends out promotions for 12 days to basically encourage people to buy things. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? <laughs> 23rd, last minute deals. 22nd, Hanukkah starts. And 21st.
first. This is rough and then Christmas Day, and then let's not forget the 26th to 31st, uh, which is when all the end of the year deals start as well. Um, going to the next slide here, what were the cutoff dates last year? So this was shared with me, uh, this actually came directly from Amazon. Um, what you can see right here is here are the inventory cutoffs of last year. So if you wanted to get your inventory there by Black Friday and Cyber Monday, you had to have it arrive at Amazon's Fulfillment Center by the 5th of November. Again, these are going to change this year, but I assume they're going to be pretty close. If you want inventory in time for Christmas shopping, you need to make sure that it's delivered. Last year was by December 5th, so again, going to be similar to that. Uh, and then also, if you want to get your inventory uh, ready for 2019, you, can, you have to send it no earlier than this date. That's, again, what it was last year. It will change. Um, any feedback for, for you all to add here on this slide? No, this is really great information. Great. Thank you. All right. So let me kick this off here. What does it take to be a successful seller? Now, I, when I first joined Take Metrics, I put this together. Uh, it actually could be a lot longer than this and a lot more cumbersome. But I just want to highlight that it's more than just one thing that it takes uh, to be successful in, in this in this area. And then even if you, in high data scenarios like Q4 and you have a lot of eyes and a lot of traffic, this is going to exponentially raise whatever situation you're in. If it's positive, it's going to be even more positive. If you, if as we shine lights on your business during Q4, if there, there are things you're not taking care of, like your order defect rates or your IPI or your advertising isn't good, uh, then, then obviously it's going to amplify that effect. So one through six is sort of the chronological uh, thing, you know, uh, chronological life cycle of, of a seller or a product access to capital do you have money for inventory and you keep your lights on product listings advertising logistics customer support if you all are frantically writing down don't worry we're going to send this out but i wanted to highlight that look there's a lot that goes in to what it takes to be a successful seller liz you and i have both been on this voyage um to actually find all the biggest and best brightest players in each one of these these boxes as well I also wanted to highlight what we are going to be covering today. So what we are, like, obviously we, we use uh, machine learning and, and world-class data to automate and optimize advertising. We're going to be talking about uh, advertising. Liz, if you just want to give a little bit shout out about Ecom Engine and what you guys cover just really quickly, it, you know, just to be good to, to, for some context. Sure, absolutely. So we have three different software tools for Amazon sellers. One is Feedback 5. Most people have heard of that. That's a reputation management tool. Uh, we've got Restock Pro, which is an inventory management tool, and then we've got Market Scout, which is a product research tool. So a lot of our study and research has been about why feedback and reviews matter, how they impact your seller health. And then with the inventory performance index metric that was rolled out uh, June before last, I think it was, um, how you manage your inventory and your supply chain and, and how that actually impacts your seller health too. So we have a couple areas of focus. Those are a couple of them. That's what we're going to be talking about today are those seller metrics and how to use automation to stay on top of those so that you do have the opportunity to do the, the deeper dive stuff, optimizing listings, doing your advertising, and really killing it in Q4. We also talk a lot about Amazon in terms of service compliance <clears throat> in regards to product reviews, in regards to feedback, in regards to inventory. So that's sort of our area of expertise, but we're also um, very interested in general operations as they pertain to seller metrics. So that's, 100%. that's sort of where I am today. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, if you have questions that even beyond the scope of what we talked about here today, email me or, or Liz or Becky and we can get you guys uh, uh, making sure that you guys are, are set up for success and have access to the right solution. So the flywheel is bigger than we think. Take a metrics. Our solution is called flywheel. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is obviously on the back of the Amazon flywheel. But the way we look at flywheel is, is if you start very, very focused on data science, and, and understanding what's happening, and you use this to lower your cost of, 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 of advertising, improving the performance of advertising, it's gonna to lead to increased sales. 
If you increase advertising sales, you're naturally going to generate more reviews and a more positive sales rank if you, if you had that sales velocity in a positive relation with Amazon's algorithm. Then if you're doing that, you're going to start ranking organically. Look, there's this really ridiculous causal relationship that makes Amazon and marketplace is very, very different than Google and, and other channels, which is ad spend in ad performance is directly tied to organic ranking. So if you are ranking more organic, uh, better organically, you're getting more data, the flywheel spins. The thing is, is like, this is just a small microcosm of what it means to be successful. So if sellers are matched with the right tools to help uh, optimize, to help them grow. Then you dump them into our flywheel, these tools being like the suite of solutions that Ecom Engine has, uh, as an example. Sellers are in a better position to capitalize on increased traffic. And sellers gain momentum and the flywheel spins faster. So this is the way, and I think this is the premise of what we're talking about here, Liz, is, is we obviously do what we do very well. You all do what you do as well, as well. Uh, but... You, you need to, you need to be doing all of these things right you know what i mean yes absolutely yeah um so let's actually start off by running a poll i love running polls here so i'm going to go ahead and get one started for us and the question is how often do you check your odr your ipi and other metrics so odr so is your order defect rate and your ipi is your inventory performance index yeah so i am launching this poll here um, you all should start. Uh, oh, I see everybody starting to, to give some answers here. This is some some good feedback here. Um, we'll go like another five or six seconds here. You seeing some of these results, guys? Interesting. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So. So you can you can see here um, a pretty interesting break. What, what's your what is your first reaction here, Liz? Seeing this? Well, it's a good thing that those seventeen people are here um, to learn about those things. But I love seeing that that people are checking on their on their metrics every day. Um, this is about what I've experienced in the industry. This is about the split that I've seen. So I'm not shocked, but. Um, that's what I'm here for is to help people understand what these metrics are and how to stay within them so that they keep a healthy seller account. Sean had an interesting one. He talked about ODR versus IPI. Should you be checking one more than the other? So ODR, he, um, you know, mentioned checking weekly IPI is daily. Um, what's your take on that? I think that, um, during different times, people pay more attention to their inventory performance index rating because it does dictate your next quarter's uh, storage allocation. Um, in terms of ODR, if you haven't had a whole lot of negative feedbacks, if you haven't had a whole lot of uh, A to Z uh, claims, if you haven't had a whole lot of returns, then you, you can pretty much bank on your ODR being about the same as it was the last time you looked. So that makes sense to me. And then, so Zoe mentioned, if you are an FBA seller, you won't see those metrics. Can you, can you touch on that? Well, you do, you do see those metrics as an FBA seller. Okay. Yeah. In, uh, central, uh, in your dashboard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So these, if you're not, if you're not looking at it, then obviously these are all in seller central and connect with us separately. We'll, we can talk to you all about how to do it. And we're, I promise uh, Mara, we're going to go into ODR as well. So that being said, tip one, Liz, over to you. All right. So um, we did have a question about ODR means what? That means your order defect rate. So feedback is part of that metric. So it's uh, your seller feedback, <clears throat> your um, A to Z guarantee claims, and chargebacks. So that makes feedback pretty important for every seller. And Amazon says, this is a quote from Seller Central, a seller who maintains a low percentage of negative feedback reflects our customer-centric philosophy. So Amazon is customer-obsessed. They expect you to be too. And while some of your feedback is, uh, is obviously a little different if you're an FBA seller than if you're not, um, 
feedback is still a metric that you have to answer for that and you have to keep track of and while if you get a negative feedback every now and then it doesn't really hurt your seller account but consistent low ratings can can really really hurt you because that order defect rate is amazon's overall metrics that rates your customer service standards so again it's um, it's your negative feedbacks, your A to Z guarantee claims, or in your chargebacks. And there's a little formula on the next slide. So it's negative feedbacks plus A to Z guarantee claims plus um, chargebacks. Yep. Plus char yeah, plus chargebacks, and then divided by the total number of orders you've received during a particular time. So Amazon policy states that you have to maintain an ODR under 1% or you could lose your selling privileges. So that could escalate very quickly, right? All of a sudden you get a whole bunch of negative feedback. It impacts your ODR. Your ODR gets over 1% and boom, you could get suspended. Um, well, we, and that would be a real bummer. Well, then Q4 as well, like Amplify, right? If you don't check this that often, what happens when you're having, you know, 10x the amount of, like, the 20x, whatever it is, the amount of uh, of, of of buyers coming to the platform, right? It, like, you have to even check it that much more often. And if you're too busy selling, 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 and you're not looking at your ODR and stuff like that, you could actually get cut off from selling in, in the midst of the busiest holiday season. I mean, we've all seen it happen, you know what I mean? Right. So, really, really important you stay on top of it. Well, and a really easy way to... to so obviously you want to pay attention to your A to Z guarantee claims. You want to pay attention to your chargebacks, but you can also get alerts. If we go over to the next slide, um, you can get alerts on your negative feedbacks so that you can address those problems right away. So obviously feedback five is a tool that lets you ask for feedback from your orders, but it also lets you get alerts on the negative feedback that you receive. Um, and that's super important. Like maybe even more than asking for is important to keep track of it and, mm -hmm. and know when you get a negative feedback and know that, and, and know that the faster that you respond to the buyer who has given you negative feedback, the, the better chance you have of a creating a happy customer. Cause that's really the whole point of all this, but B, um, you can, at this point, per Amazon Terms of Service, you can ask a buyer to modify or remove feedback after you've solved their problem. You can't do that with product reviews. Heavens no, don't try that <laughs> with product reviews, but you can do it with feedback. So if a buyer withdraws or modifies a negative feedback, your ODR will likely be adjusted within 48 hours. And so mm -hmm. because there's that 48-hour window, you want to try to implement automation to get, receive alerts on negative feedback so that you can act really fast and that will protect your ODR in terms of negative feedback and your seller account. So. A couple of things you can add here. I mean, just an example of that. I think we all like examples. If you have somebody, somebody orders something and, and let's say it gets lost in the mail or something, right? right. They go in there and they give you a really crappy review. Like they have every right to because they never got their product. What happens if that actually you find it's an FBA issue or you solve it, right? And you go in there and they, they, I've seen it all the time. They're like, hey, seller addressed my concerns. Very happy with how they've done it. I've changed my rating. Like that's, that's obviously good. But like, look, if you don't know that it's happening and you're not checking it manually or why not just automate this and be like, hey, you had a negative review or you had a positive review. You want to know what's happening. Like the tools like, you know, Feedback 5 are a great way to do that. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, which and, leads us to and oh, when we get finished, Mar uh, Mara, Mara, I will tell you exactly where in Seller Central um, to find the order defect rate. But um, but let's move on to product reviews real quick so that Jason has time to talk and I don't take up the whole time because <laughs> I will I will totally <laughs> talk this whole time. So um, so tip number two. Tis the season for product reviews. Uh, absolutely, as traffic increases, then so do hopefully your product reviews. And product reviews are still a, like a really hot topic, right? And they have been since October 2016. I like to call that review gate because that's when Amazon did away with incentivized reviews. And uh, so the, the landscape's really changed since then. Go ahead, Jason. Those who 
what happened then. Can you talk about what happened during ReviewGate? <laughs> right. So that was October 2016. And prior to Amazon's announcement that they were doing away with incentivized reviews, you could send a free or deeply, deeply, deeply discounted product to a person and say, please write a product review on this. And all they would have to do is say, I received this product in, in return for my honest review. And there were Facebook groups, there were companies built around um, getting those product reviews by getting the products into people's hands and asking them to write reviews. It was, of course, grossly manipulated <laughs> um, by some bad actors. And when Amazon saw that, Correct. they did away with that practice. So that was a big, big deal. Um, it, it, um, and then Heather had a good question. Can you explain how to avoid sending feedback requests to customers who sent us a message? Um, particularly in feedback five? Or in general, I mean, answer it however you want, but yeah. Um, you can exclude orders with most tools. So if you've received a, a message and you have your timing set up in a way that you give yourself a little bit of wiggle room, um, if you get a message from somebody, then you can exclude that order, at least with our tool you can. Um, and I think awesome. that, I think that probably uh, Rachel in customer success has other tips on that too. So if you're a Feedback 5 user, and thank you for being a Feedback 5 user, um, absolutely schedule an optimization uh, appointment with with Rachel or Eliza or Franz in, or Buen in customer success. I mean, this is that it's absolutely free to you, um, and we will dig into your account and help you get better results and better conversions and make sure that your emails are only going to the people that you want them to go to. So. Um, a little plugs, shameless self-promotion is happening right now. Um, <laughs> so, so we talked about product reviews. Product reviews are still a big deal. They're hard to get. When Amazon did away with incentivized product reviews, they did introduce the early reviewer program. That gets mixed, uh, mixed reviews. Is I say that word over and over again. Um, I, I talked to a lot of sellers who think the early reviewer program is awesome. And talk to a few who say that they hate it and it didn't do them any good. But the the majority of sellers I talked to really like the early, but that only guarantees what up to five reviews. So, and they say that the magic number for reviews when things really start rolling for you is 20. So you've got to get those reviews and that's what asking for them does. Um, you've got to be TOS compliant. I have whole presentations and have spoken for hours and hours and hours about TOS compliance terms of service compliance, why it's so important and why it is just not worth it to get suspended over a review request. Reviews Most abuse of is big on Amazon's radar right now. They've really been cracking down. People have been restricted for hours from, from sending any messages to buyers. It is a big, big deal. Eyes are on it and there is no room for non-compliance. I will just, I can't stress that enough. Yeah. White hat. Oh yeah. yeah. Do it right. It's a uh, obviously it's a, a, a riveting topic of conversation is Amazon COS. It, it's super important though. It, like all jokes aside, like literally, like I mean, feel free to chime in if you have a horror story about getting suspended, especially something that not even knowing what you did or didn't do, right? Like oh my gosh, like all the time. I mean, it happens. I like somebody. Now, some people are, are just not paying attention to TOS, and Amazon doesn't accept the, oh, I didn't know, you know, because yeah. the, all of the terms of service, while they're not all laid out in the same place and they're not extremely easy to find, um, they're there, and it's your job as a seller to know them. But Like, what do they say? Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. It's literally the same thing when it comes to TOS. Absolutely, and the attention on reviews abuse right now is much, much more intense than it used to be. Um, because there's still people gaming the system. There's still black hat uh, tactics all over the place. There are review farms. There are, I mean, it, it's actually getting into the, the I, I like to call it the muggle world, right? Because if we're in the in the Amazon seller, no. And then we've got the, the rest of the world out there that's not really clued into 
to third party Amazon sellers. Um, and it's starting to get out there, right? Like there was that BuzzFeed news article. Um, it's, it's getting some attention in the press that there's, there's black hat stuff going on and Amazon is totally committed. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Think about it this way is like you, you have the choice to be a good or a bad actor outside of all the obvious aspects of getting burned, whatever, like, you know, you're going to get burned if you're a bad actor. If you're not a good actor, you don't have your, 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 um, you know, your, your house in order. If you try and tell Amazon, Hey, look, I'm brand registered. This person is doing this or that or whatever. Amazon's also going to take a look at your own account. health. like, Hey, is this like a credible, I mean, obviously this is more speculative, but they're going to look like, okay, is this a good seller that has a good track record or is there stuff that they haven't done well either? All that, I have to assume it's, you know, more of a black box, but all that pays it. Like I remember with World First when we were, we, we helped sellers provide, providing local bank accounts. Sometimes if they updated something like a bank account, they, they, they'd act, it would trigger a review for their entire account. So the folks who actually did things right and there was nothing bad to really discover when they go snooping around, that just puts you in a better position anyways. Absolutely. Well, and like in, in a case of, I, I talked to Chris McCabe a lot because he deals with people who get suspended and, and, um, and I like to know what's going on in that world. And he's just a really knowledgeable guy. And Leah McHugh, who works with him is sort of the ASIN variation queen. She understands all the rules about ASIN variation. And if you've got an ASIN variation violation, they're going to look at all your ASINs. So I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I know that for sure. But we're getting yeah. off topic, and, and it's almost your turn. But let's talk about inventory performance index real quick. Um, and I actually just recently, Sean and I did a webinar with Feedvisor on this topic, and that you can find that on our webinars page on ecomengine.com. Just go to resources and go to webinars, and um, and you can, Becky, if, if you could pop a link to that, that will go more in depth on this. And I'm just gonna like kind of review it for you guys now. So. Your inventory performance index is a metric that Amazon uses to pretty much decide if you're eligible for unlimited storage, like very bottom line, very basic. It combines three months of historical sales, inventory levels, and costs into a single metric, and then it helps you identify ways to improve your inventory performance as an FBA seller. So as of September of 2019, when, when uh, I grabbed this graphic off of the Amazon site, a score of 500 or more is great, right? But if you remember a couple months ago, a score of 550 was great. Um, when they rolled this metric out at Boost in New Orleans of June of last year, they said that the number might change and it's all based on the available space in FBA warehouses. So like this metric exists for you as a seller because obviously the, the things that are covered, it's excess inventory, it's... Um, <clears throat> It's your sell-through rate, it's stranded inventory, and then it's your your in stock. You know, so making sure that you've got stuff in stock. So all of that works in your favor in terms of your success on the marketplace. But Amazon also wants to make sure that you're not um, lagging in your inventory management because they don't want to be a, a, a storage facility. They want to be a fulfillment center, right? So they don't want you sending in inappropriate items for the season. Or, or anything like that. Um, they want things Very to be good. moving at a clip, like quickly. And, and you do too, right? You do too. So um, what happens if you fall below uh, and you get in trouble with your IPI is that you get hit with limited storage um, and then that could carry over into the next quarter too. So if you were hit with limited storage fees, limited storage or fees this quarter, um, it's still like a really really good time to start improving your inventory performance index with the storage you have now working with that and we've got some tips for that so be, be sure to reach out to me if you want to talk inventory management strategy because i love to talk about that so it's just liz at um, yeah, and then real quick on chris mccabe it's e-commerce chris is his company and we're yeah. happy to give you great guy former amazonian really good service and also a bostonian so. Yes, yes, and he he does a a seller event every month faithfully. Um, so if you're in the area, check that out and uh, just go to Meetup and and take a look around for that because those are really really valuable events. 
reach out to us. Um, awesome. Well, anything else, Liz, on, on your side? No, I think I, I think I went on and on. So I'm sorry, but <laughs> I get really no. excited about this stuff. Look, but you, that's why I would say that's why we bring folks like you on. Is you have a whole different vantage point that we don't have. Do you know what I mean? So, um, well, cool. So let's go ahead and run the second poll here. The poll question is. What is your advertising strategy for Q4? Let me go ahead and launch this uh, this bad boy here. Launch poll. All right, folks, you should be able to, to see it here. Um, interesting. I love the engagement too. You know what I mean? To seeing yeah. everybody. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and launch, close this. Let's uh, share these results here. So what we've seen here is, yeah, actually a third of you aren't going to increase spend. And then probably, uh, you know, just a slight majority, actually right at 50, uh, yeah, about 55%, slight majority is go are going to be increasing spend as well as uncapping budgets and actually advertising less. Um, as I go through this, I think, yeah, I love, I, I'm a, my hope, my goal here is to prove to you all that you should be increasing your spend. Matter of fact, you should be uncapping your budgets and we're gonna back it by data at the exact same time. So cool, let me go ahead and close this poll here, hide results. Let me go ahead and get back to, all right, you can see my screen again, right? Yeah. Awesome. So the internet makes it possible for any product from anywhere in the world to be on Amazon, but how do shoppers find your brand? advertising you can do everything else right you have a perfect I ipi a very good odr but still it just it's not going to be enough matter of fact i get this all the time no i'm good i already dominate organic rankings i don't need to advertise at all actually it's not enough so let me go ahead and give you a quick example of this so here's an example of a, just typing in slow cooker on amazon this is all above the fold Ninja is sponsoring, doing headline, uh, headline search sponsored brands right here. Uh, Crockpot is advertising these two products here. So right now, this is on a desktop version. It's just as bad. It actually even, um, you know, it can even be more daunting on mobile. So if you're not advertising at all, even if you're ranking organically, you, you're not being found. So that just proves that it, it's it's you actually really do need to uh, to advertise because simply just just having a positive organic uh, uh, presence there is surely not enough. So with that being said, what is the optimal campaign structure that balances maximum control and maximum scalability? Well, I'm going to show you. <laughs> so we recommend a three to one audience based campaign structure. What that means is you're gonna have one auto campaign and you're gonna have three manual campaigns. Again, this is obviously works extremely well with Take a Metrics technology, but our goal is to get, look, we do hundreds of millions of dollars of Amazon ad spend is flowing through Take a Metrics. We're gonna give you things that transcend whether you're using Take a Metrics or not. So don't look at this as any sort of plug. There's plenty of time for a plug later. This is literally just what we see as best practices um, that met balances, again, results with the ability to scale. So an example here, if you're on, we're going to use an example of memory foam pillows. So you're going to have one, at least one auto campaign uh, for memory foam pillows, and then you're going to have three different set of manual campaigns. You're going to have one for all of your own branded terms, uh, one campaign for all of your competitor terms, and then one for generic. So what this actually looks like is on, under the campaigns, uh, the branded campaign, this is a defensive strategy. This is the example here of you actually advertising for take a metrics foam pillow if we were to sell one. Um, this again, if you're not doing this, somebody else will do it. Matter of fact, that's the third strategy, which is go after your competitor um, or second strategy here. This is like, okay, take a metrics is trying to compete with Tempur-Pedic. Let's go out there and run a campaign and target all of our competitors. This is a higher A cost strategy, but it's very effective at or riding on the coattails of another successful products or even a weaker products uh, exposure, and you can really start to gain market share. The other one is generic. This is memory foam pillow, comfy memory foam pillow, cool memory foam pillow, whatever it is. So that this allows you to really start to segment your audience. It is more important to segment by audience type 
rather than match type, like broad phrase exact. You're creating more work for yourself. So why does this matter? 78% of searches on Amazon are for generic terms. This means that everybody thinks that, oh, the biggest brands uh, you win. Yeah, maybe if they're the ones dominating the, the, the search results on generic, but they're not necessarily going to their brands. And it's actually probably even higher because a lot of folks find something under generic and then they, they bookmark it or like, oh, I'm actually going to go ahead and look for that specific one later. So I would, I would say that probably, you know, a much higher percentage starts out as a generic uh, as well. And the, the reason why this matters is generic brand competitor, all those terms are going to behave differently. You should expect a higher conversion with a lower ACoS on your own brand because they're coming to buy your brand. You should expect a lower conversion and a higher ACoS on the competitors, and then the generic should be somewhere in the middle. Um, there's my source of the article as well, about 78%. It's always good to cite a source. Uh, expect tip number five expect markedly higher volume but do not expect material increases in cost per click and conversion rates so let's look at this uh, Liz you and I were talking about this uh, quite a bit yesterday so what is the difference of supply and demand when it comes to Q4 on Amazon supply is consumers aka traffic this is a supply of traffic coming in in a buyer's mode to purchase an item on Amazon the demand is advertisers uh, who are uh, sellers who are buying ads based on Amazon. Supply completely exceeds demand, meaning there are so many more eyes and buyers on your product uh, compared to the increase in, in, in advertisers and advertising. Yes, more advertisers buy advertising, but the traffic of consumers significantly outpaces this. Sellers, this is your Super Bowl. This is why this is about Q4. We all know it. Um, let's look at some actual data let's back this data up. uh let's back the, this up with data why are we going to look at prime day data because prime day is a is a, a specific example a microcosm of a high data scenario that is an incredible precursor to q4 amazon runs prime day it generates a bunch of buzz people are coming in and they're buying it's very similar to what happens during q4 around the holidays so prime day what do we analyze? We actually analyzed over 1,500 products sold by our clients. And we compared the Monday, Tuesday of Prime Day with the previous four Mondays and Tuesdays. And every one of these products had to have at least one sale in those previous days. And let's actually see what the data told us. So blue was Prime Day or teal, and then let's call it coral for non-Prime Day. Um, <laughs> you like those colors, right? I, I, like, I like, we can go with salmon if we want. Um, a cost per click. Cost per click actually lowered during Prime Day for our, for our sellers and, 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 and uh, our, our folks who are advertising. So it usually costs um, you have 56 cents per click. Uh, uh, in aggregate, it was about 53 uh, cents. So it actually lowered. Conversion rate stayed the exact same. This is important because everybody talks about how it was so expensive to advertise in during Q4 and it isn't worth it. Um, but look, what really happens here is you're, it, it, the only thing that's expensive is the fact that you only have a limited budget and those you run out of how, how much budget you have. It's not more expensive necessarily per se. It, your, your cost per click is relatively the same and so is uh, the conversion rate. Um, so is the brand, just a, answer a couple questions. Hunter, you said, is the brand referring to all brands that compete with you? That will be a competitor's brand. So an so example, as we mentioned too, if I'm Take a Metrics and we're the company selling memory foam pillows, we're going to bid on every keyword and isolate those keywords in our manual campaign uh, associated with Take a Metrics. Um, and then the other side, if I want to go after Tempur-Pedic, Purple, Casper, those all gonna go to my competitors uh, at, at the same time. Uh, Ethan, to answer your question, yes, we are going to send this as a follow up um, uh, here as well. The other thing Hunter asks is about if you're not brand registered, obviously you can be going after any of these brands as well, but Amazon is trying to really cater to folks who own IP in the brands as well. So it, it definitely behooves you to, to get brand registered if you can, but if you're still a reseller or, or, or anything like that, um, you know, you could still be advertising as well. Liz, were there any, or Becky, any questions that we missed other than that or anything to add here? 
I don't uh, know. No, I think you got them. Awesome. So this goes to my next point. 8% uh, of folks said that they will uncap their budgets. And let me show you why it's important to uncap if, uh, if you can. So why should you increase budgets? Going back to our beautiful teal and coral here. The two-day ad spend that we analyze of our clients say they, they average a 33% increase in their ad spend, but revenue during that period, total revenue grew 540%. Look at that ROI. This is showing you that there's so much demand and traffic that is in a buying state that even if you are spending more, you're gonna have a very, roughly a similar CPC, uh, similar conversion rate. And even if you're, in, you're gonna have a much more of a positive return on total revenue from that ad spend. Like this is black and white, the success that our sellers had here. Now it's time to talk about tacos. For the folks on the West Coast or the, the folks who eat late, uh, obviously hopefully this is you know, getting you going a bit. Um, Hopefully this is resonating with, with everybody else. But oh, first off, this is an incredible image of a taco, or three tacos, I should say, right? Um, so what is tacos? Tacos is, a, we all know A cost, right? A cost is your advertising cost of advertising revenue. It's taking your ad spend and driving it and then looking what it, the return is compared to ad revenue. Tacos is, ad spend into total revenue, which includes both ad revenue and organic revenue. Tacos captures the flywheel effect, because if you start with very good ad spend and, and ad performance, it's going to drive total revenue. And we all know the goal is not to drive ad revenue, it's to drive total revenue. More importantly, it's to drive profit. Our data highlights how you should be viewing the impact of ad spend, and it's investing in ad spend to grow total revenue not just ad revenue. I know we have some other questions too. So if, if there's anything you all wanted to call out uh, or answer, let me know. Um, let me, let's just go ahead and take some of these. So Jacob said for the three to one auto campaign structure, would auto campaign be competing against the manual campaigns and raising the costs up? No, the whole point of an auto campaign is an exploratory campaign. This is you're telling Amazon, go out there, and find keywords that are that are that that are converting that I should know about. Then you can move it from your auto campaign to your manual campaign. And you have the ability to negate it from your auto campaign as well. Uh, that way, you're um, you, you're you're not. Um, so I'm just going to the next question here. Um, yeah, that way you're not you know competing against yourself on that keyword. Uh, can you speak to best practices regarding resellers doing closeouts? We actually have, in our help center, we actually have a recommended uh, at chart about if you're doing a closeout, how you should be setting your, your max advertising cost of sale targets and increasing your advertising based on how many days it takes you to close out inventory. Um, these are some very good questions. I'm gonna save some of these towards the end. Um, and obviously keep asking because I'm going to try and address them as I can too, but I want to make sure we get through all this content. Of course, not all products deserve to be advertised. Which products should you focus on advertising? So products with very healthy margins, low tacos while revenue grows. What that means is even if you're ingress increasing ad spend by 33%, seeing total revenue grow at 540% means that you're going to lower your tacos percentage, but you're growing your ad spend and growing revenue at a faster rate. That is an incredible thing to see happen. Uh, gateway products, frequently bought with, right? Or if you're going to sell the, the 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 PlayStation, but you're really you're going after the selling the games as well. That's a, that's a, or you know products that are, you know you don't mind it, they 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 buy them frequently, right? Things that are re reusable or if they re up their purchases, completely good to advertise. And when you need to clear inventory at the same time, as well as a newly launched SKU, advertise the hell out of that thing. Um, tip number seven, leading into Black Friday and Cyber Monday, you do not necessarily need to provide discounts or promos to generate revenue. So going back to the, uh, uh, to the, to the um, prime date data, 60% of our clients did not lower their price. Matter of fact, 40% of them increased their price. So how did they actually fare? with doing so. Well, first off, 94% of products studied grew revenue on Prime Day. 496%, which roughly 5X total revenue growth for the folks who did not 
lower their price. Matter of fact, some of them even increase their price as well. So those folks are just capturing um, and, cap and just really converting the more eyes that are on their product. Uh, but we're also what we're also not saying is you're going to see me talk about this as well is it does not mean you shouldn't advertise or a, a discount because there's a there's a strategic reason you should do so. But this is truly jaw dropping where folks who just either increase their price or didn't change their price saw almost a 500 percent increase in total revenue. That's incredible. Liz, I know when I told you this yesterday, it was uh, it was crazy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Paul, I love it. You said, FYI, I always increase my pricing. I think absolutely. Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, so a couple of things. Um, John asked a good question about what, what do you do when an auto doesn't generate any keywords or impressions? A couple of things you should start to isolate, uh, isolate, isolate and creating words over here. Um, you should try and isolate what the issue is. First thing I would say is, what is your budget? Increase your budget. That's the number one thing. The other thing too is Amazon, this goes back into having your house in order beyond just advertising is you have to have a very well optimized listing to maximize your ROI from advertising because Amazon goes into your listings. They go into your metadata, they go into your tags, they go into your keywords and the copy of your listing. And that's where they're pulling out keywords. They think that you should be, you should be associated with. So that's the first thing is Amazon's not getting good keywords because your listing isn't great. That's number one thing I would check. Um, cool, going on, don't get us wrong. We clearly showed you discounts worked because not only did the, the ones who, who did discount or did not discount, so a 500% increase, the ones who did so an 820% increase. So be strategic, run promotions if you have sale inventory that you wanna move. Old models, designs, or versions you're trying to clear out. Uh, while you're launching a new product, all good reasons to offer a discount. Gateway products again as well. Then lastly, this is a shameless plug, but I think it's an incredible tip of the cap to what we're doing here at Take a Metrics. And that is um, hourly bidding is critical. Before I get here, uh, Steve had a question. What are your feelings in rewriting your listing every six months or so as Google recommends and shopping ads? A few things here. This isn't Google, so just taking those, even though it's similar in a lot of ways, do not just duplicate your strategy and what you do in these channels. Very first thing is I would ask, what's happening with your traffic? What's happening with your impressions? What's happening with your conversion rates or click-through rates? If they're good, if it ain't broke, certainly don't try and fix it. This is also a good opportunity for you to test, um, you know, A-B test a headline or A-B test images, et cetera, and see if you can get it, see whether the move is positive or negative. I would isolate though, right? Don't change your bullets and your title because if you see an increase or drop, you don't know whether it was a bullets or title. Do one thing at a time and go with that. Liz, you probably recommend the same thing when it comes to uh, your, your emails or seller outreach post purchase, right? Well, I, it, it all depends. That all, that's a kind of a loaded question because that all depends. It depends on your category. It depends on the type of product you have, but um, it's not to have just one blanket strategy. You have to treat every category and look at the context uh, uh, of what works for a particular category or a seller or an audience, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and your timing has to be based on uh, what makes sense for your buyer, too. 100%. Cool. So going back to tip number eight, why hourly bidding is critical. So what is hourly bidding? Take a metrics has the power to access campaign data on an hourly basis, such as impressions, clicks, sales, every 60 minutes. We are able to synthesize and analyze this data every hour and then proactively adjust bids based on this data. Doesn't mean we will, means we will adjust a bid. If the data tells us we don't need to, we don't. Um, in high data scenarios like Q4, this means that you can be more dynamic and adjust your bids before your competitors do. You have a limited time to be as lucrative as possible. We give you the ability to win more impressions and generate more sales. So let's actually give you an example of what a new campaign looks like for, for people who are doing it manually or, or maybe some other tools to do it daily or weekly. So let's say you have a new campaign day one, you're just, you know, you're just trying to see what works. Um, you may even use some of your organic data uh, to, to set your, you know, where your bid should be or what your conversion rates are. I can give you methodology of ways you should set it with, if you're running a new campaign, you've already been selling that product, use your conversion rates, like calculate a bid that makes sense. We can help you with that. But generally speaking, day one, uh, you're, you're just waiting to see what happens. Uh, day zero, then day one, you get one dart. All right, I have one data set. Great. Let me throw a dart at the dartboard. 
Uh, number, okay, date, now I have two darts to throw because I have another day's worth of data. Okay, now I have three days. I have three days worth of data. Now I can throw a third dart. Now with hourly bidding, imagine being able to throw multiple darts in that day. Matter of fact, imagine being able to stand closer and more accurately, um, you know, get closer to that bullseye. This is what hourly data can do for you. Now let's talk about lag and catching data. What I am not saying is that Amazon makes it, the data crystal clear. We all know there's a big attribution uh, challenge, right? Amazon doesn't tell you right away whether that, wh whether that, um, that uh, click from an advertising led to a sale. The delivery of their conversion data, it's not nearly as reliable as Prime. And what, is, what do I mean by that? So, hey, remember those 20 clicks you got with zero sales? Well, actually, three, four days later or whenever, uh, there were actually two sales from that. So here's an example. Let's say that you have a bid on a keyword that's $10 for this around number. Amazon sends data at 10 a.m. Okay, here's conversion data from Amazon. Nothing comes between uh, uh, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. All of a sudden at 4 p.m., Amazon sends conversion data to you as well. And then they do again at 8. Well, what happens if when we get that data at around 4 p.m., we realize that your bid, hey, that bid, $10 is way too high. So we get the conversion data at 11 a.m. We're like, you know what? $10 is actually spot on. We were right, predictive analytics for money. We don't have any data to tell us to adjust otherwise, keep it at 10. All of a sudden we get data at 4 p.m. and says, you know what? You should really lower it. You should lower it to $6. What I'm saying here is like Amazon at some point has to tell you that that sale may have come from advertising or is that it's a high data scenario like Q4, this is going to be monumental for you to make a change if need be, uh, you know, intraday. So we're telling you now have the ability to look back and actually take advantage of that as well. Um, and then lastly, that rounds out most of the content for the day, but I wanted just to give you all a, a few key takeaways. Um, Liz, do you want to take number one? Yeah, absolutely. So in order to keep this flywheel that Jason's talking about spinning, you need to stay on top of your seller health. So think about your inventory performance index. Think about getting alerts for your negative feedbacks. Um, think about getting alerts for your negative product reviews. I didn't men mention before, but with those, you need to respond in line actually on the listing um, and that that shows potential shoppers that you're responsive and that you're responsible um, and we've got loads and loads of, of product review strategies um, on our website and in my brain so just contact me and we can talk about that mm -hmm. and um, there were some questions about where to find your ODR and your IPI in Seller Central so um, I can show you that if you contact me awesome 2019 prime data shows us prime day data shows us that advertisers uh, that it's an advertiser's market. So plan to increase budgets. Uh, if you guys aren't convinced by now, uh, I don't know what to tell you because we have a lot of data to back that up. Uh, but look, don't expect markedly higher higher CPCs, cost per clicks, or conversion rates. Uh, it's simply you're just going to get a lot more traffic. Um, our rising tide raises all ships. Most products shall see an increase in revenue, but those who entice customers of Promos can see larger traffic. Um, and then, yeah, uh, do you want to talk about uh, a special offer you want to you're giving to our audience as well? Sure. If you're not already a user of our tools, just use the coupon code Tika, and you can get a 30-day free trial of Feedback Five, uh, Restock Pro, or 150 free credits on Market Scout if you're a reseller and you want to do some product research. But I do recommend as we get closer and closer to the beginning of Q4, that if you aren't using automation tools to help you run your business, really think about that. Obviously, don't buy stuff you don't need, but um, it's a lot easier to get started now, today, than it is to get started in, in about a week or so, right? So um, take advantage of a free trial, try it out, and, and see what you think. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Awesome. And then, yes, we actually offer a free 30-day trial for, for individual brands and sellers who want to come in and check out our platform. Uh, if you guys are an agency as well, feel free to just reach out to me directly. Uh, my email is jmagee, M-A-G-E-E, -E, at takeametrics.com. J-M-A-G-E-E, -E, at takeametrics.com. Um, Liz, if you actually want to chat, I'll just go ahead and chat my, uh, yeah, we should probably just uh, chat our emails in here. Yeah. Well. Yeah, mine's easy though. It's liz at ecomengine.com. So there's mine there as well.
Um, folks, I wanted to say thank you all so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. I, I think rather than, I like this approach of not just waiting to the end to answer questions, let's try and answer them on the fly. Um, Sean did have one question about what is Market Scout. So Liz, you wanna talk about that? Um, I can give you a demo and you know my number, um, but it used to be Ecom Spy. Got it. I love it. Well, folks, thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you guys have learned something. And yeah, uh, please reach out on LinkedIn, email, et cetera. And we really look forward to having helping you guys have a successful Q4. Thanks so um, much th for having us today, Jason. And this was great. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Take care.